Good to meet with Bert Martinez. Marketing consultant Bert Martinez joins Bert us Martinez for this Bert Martinez joins us now from the newsroom. This is... I have a special, special guest today, uh, Brandon Webb. Uh, Brandon Webb is uh, remarkable in a couple of different ways. First of all, uh, Brandon is a U.S. Navy SEAL uh, or former uh, U.S. Navy SEAL. Uh, he served our country. Um, in my book, anybody who serves our country is a hero. But I think when you become a, uh, you, you know, a, a Navy SEAL, I think you take it to a different level. Uh, he's also uh, multiple times uh, bestseller. And I'm excited to have him on the show. He's an entrepreneur. Um, and uh, anyway, very interesting guy. Brandon Webb, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. You bet. All right, so I gotta I gotta ask you this. Um, you have done a couple of different things, uh, be, you know, and, and I think this is kind of unique because you you left uh, the seals and then you went, if I remember correctly, you went right into uh, your own business. Kind of give us a, a, a kind of a, a recap of, or a, a Reader's Digest uh, version of your background. Sure. So, you know, it's I had an interesting childhood growing up. Uh, ended up living on a sailboat with my family for a few years. That got me into the diving industry. I got my first job on a scuba diving boat, um, which you know led to my dad throwing me off the boat in Tahiti at 16 because it was like having two captains on the boat. Um, I I kind of had that diving background. Found my way into the SEAL teams. Had a, had a really inter amazing career um, I was you know right up to 93 I was in the Navy uh, I started as a search and rescue swimmer but I wanted to be a seal so I I applied um, it took me two applications my second application got approved I went to the seal teams um, deployed to Afghanistan Iraq uh, else, elsewhere in the Middle East and then at the towards the end of my my career in the Navy I was uh, getting into the sniper training around the sniper program uh, the last couple years I was in as course manager and then I just kind of burn out I, I stopped it stopped being fun for me and I saw this like endless deployment cycle and that guys were kind of getting used up and I, I didn't want to be put into that meat grinder and, and at the time when I went to Afghanistan the mission was very clear we knew what we were there to do you know to get rid of the bad guys and and destroy the terrorist training network. But after that first couple of years, the Afghanistan mission really got, um, what I will say, schizophrenic. Like nobody knew what the hell they're doing in Afghanistan. Um, and it's it's tragic, but but I fortunately had enough foresight because I had a young family. I said, I, I, I'm not having fun anymore. I don't want to be put into this. And, and so what I, I have to, but I have a small, you know, young family, I have to provide for them. And I started thinking about other career choices and I settled on business because both my parents were entrepreneurs and I grew up in a very entrepreneurial environment. My grandmother ran a big collection agency in the 70s as a woman. So um, I said, you know what, I'm going to go into business. So I enrolled in business school. Um, I had a business plan, which conceptually today is, is was still really solid, but um, I, I was going to do this training facility and racetrack in Southern California because there's just, you know, Southern California is the capital of car country. Right. Um, you know, uh, California could probably have 10, 12 racetracks and it would be extremely successful for all of them from the car commercials to the car clubs. Um, so I, I had this, you know, looking back, I'm like, wow, I was pretty ambitious because I'm like, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't have chose that business plan today, but with, with what I know, but sometimes, you know, being a novice is, is good that way. <laughs> right, right. Well, what's the old thing? Uh, ignorance is bliss or something like that. Right. I mean, you, you don't know. And, and, yeah, and there's a, a, a huge history of people who didn't know any better and accomplished these big things. So you were on the right track. <laughs> uh, you know, and then, sorry, I'm turning this into a long story, but it, you know, I, over four years, we, um, I raised, um, about 3.8 million with the hard way through angel investors, uh, brought on some partners, um, got, took us three, just over three years to get 
the land permitted to do what we wanted to do. Uh, we got it through the county uh, planning process in, in California, which is extremely hard to do, like raw development in California, even though we're in a, a pretty friendly county um, east of San Diego called Imperial County, had the entire government support from the Border Patrol to the fire department uh, behind us. Uh, we got the project approved and it was it was a tough, tough road just to do that. And then um, the housing market collapsed, the, triggered the recession, and it was just like we had no access to capital to kind of see the project through. And on top of that, um, if it wasn't bad enough, we uh, a local environmental group that was politically active um, came after us because they they were convinced that we were associated with the company Blackwater. And many listeners may remember that was one of the biggest private military companies to kind of come out of the global war on terror and had a bunch of well-deserved bad press. You know, they had made a lot of bad mistakes. Um, and we kind of got painted with that brushstroke. And so we had this lawsuit where they sued not us, but the county over approving our project. And the county government said, hey, we'll fight this for you, but you're going to write the checks. And imagine writing a blank check to a government agency. Like, that's a freaking my worst nightmare. <laughs> and it, just, it just killed the project, really. Wow. And we, you know, I had I had it sold, actually, to an experienced developer. And, and But my part, you know, I, I had partners that were not aligned with my vision. And they weren't bad people. You know, at the time, you know, you, know, you want to, say, oh, my partners are terrible. But, you know, reflecting on it a couple of years now, I just realized I chose the wrong partners. They were good, smart people, but they had different ideas and, and a different vision than I had for the future. And, and then when you have that in a company, it creates conflict o over time. It, it creates conflict. So um, I had to walk away from the whole thing. I lost my life savings, uh, lost friends and family money, which is a terrible experience to, to have to do that. Um, you know, my own family, my mom put in money. Um, and it was, it was a tough thing for me to go through. Um, at the time I was struggling with my marriage and, um, my wife and I at the time decided to separate to, uh, and that was tough, uh, but especially coming off the heels of losing everything. And the, the good news is divorce, divorced person. It's, I didn't have to split anything. I had nothing to split. We split air. Um, in fact, I took the debt probably. I, I took the liability. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we had a really good divorce and we had, um, and we could, you know, today she's remarried and we have, I have a great relationship with her and her husband and the kids are well adjusted and doing well in school. So, I mean, that's, that's a whole separate topic, I think. Sure just the subject of divorce, but I was able to have a really good divorce and thankful that I had a, a, a willing uh, co-parent on the other end of that. Um, and then I said, okay, what do I do now? And I, en I ended up taking a corporate job uh, after doing some consulting. I got picked up by L3 Communications and they trained me as an executive, which is an incredibly valuable experience for me. Um, I worked there for there for almost two years, but was trying to figure out my next move because I, I realized that you're into corporate environment and corporate life that I, I just wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, but I, I don't think I would have appreciated um, the flexibility and freedom as being your own boss had I not had that time as an executive. Um, but it, it was a great experience for me from sales training to um, you know, a bunch of uh, experience managing government contracts. Uh, and that, that was a great, great experience, but I wanted to do, uh, get into my own business. So I, at the time I, I was, I started to get into writing just as a creative outlet. I started writing for magazines and, and then uh, my friend Marcus Attrell who wrote the book Lone Survivor was actually a student of mine at the sniper course. And we were exchanging emails. He said, Oh, you should write a book. You have an interesting background. And at the time, nobody knew about the Navy SEALs. Nobody really gave a crap, right. uh, including publishers. Like I, I, I got turned down probably 10 times. And finally, <laughs> St. Martin's Press picked me up. Uh, Mark Resnick, who's a friend of mine, good friend of mine, um, 
out of that relationship was a senior editor and he just took a bet. He gave me like a, I think I got a $25,000 advance and, and which is like bottom of the bucket <laughs> advance. I know that now. Um, and then through that, I got into blogging. I, I got asked to blog for military.com and that, that experience showed me, wow, there's, I can build a, launch my own website. And so that started my business that I run today, Hurricane Media. I, out of my experience at military.com, as a blogging, I'd get home at night and just write a blog post and then they turned over the whole site to me. Um, and I learned how to create engagement and build an audience. And, and that's when I said, you know what, I'm gonna launch my own website focused around this kind of special interest, like general male interest in the special operations community the same way guys tune in and watch football games and sports and follow their favorite athletes. So um, I launched that business six years ago um, and we added e-commerce to it two years ago through a, a business called the Crate Club, which is basically a James Bond in a box every month for guys. Um, and it's been a great business. Like we're, I bootstrapped it to date. Um, we're going to do a big, raise this year to kind of accelerate growth but you know we're eight figures and i want to get us to ninth to be a nine figure business so um yeah it's been my entrepreneurial journey has been extremely humbling at times uh, but also very very rewarding because i you know the hard work does pay off and um you know i get to take trips with my kids and have a ton of flexibility in my schedule and i, and I built a a flexible uh, work from home workforce. So the, you know, the idea that my head of brand Jason can be at his kids soccer games on the weekend um, or, or weekday can take them to the doctor's office and have the flexibility to do that feels pretty good as, as a, you know, founder CEO. Um, and, and I get letters from my team. This is like, thank you for my freedom. And, and so it's, it's cool to have that kind of business today that lets, people make a really good living, but have the flexibility to take vacations. Like my customer service director, Jason manages, uh, or I'm sorry, Justin, he manages about 20 people in the Philippines. And he's like, hey, I'm gonna go work for Mexico for two months. He's like, I'm good. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> knock yourself out. I mean, that's pretty cool to be able to yeah, do yeah. that. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. that, that's kind of my entrepreneur story. I also own um, a, third-party logistics business that we launched last year. Uh, I launched that with a partner. Um, and, uh, you know, that, you know, we, six months we generated almost half a million in revenue. And, and that, that looks like that business is going to, going to take off because there's, there's not a lot of, there's in that particular logistics industry, there's a lot of legacy companies that kind of, they're, they're embedded in, you know, states that are not tax and labor friendly. Um, they're just used to doing things the old fashioned way. They don't integrate with, with um, e-commerce sales platform technologies. And, and so I was frustrated. I, I was complaining to a friend of mine in New York City about um, that we'd been on our second logistics provider. Cause we didn't, you know, we didn't want to ship our own products. It's a, it's a separate business to kind of accept inventory, store it, pick and pack, and send it out to customers. Um, and so I was just complaining. He's like, well, why don't we start our own? And so, right. um, and he owns a big staffing company, one of the top 10 uh, in the world. So um, yeah, we staffed it up and and uh, we chose a great location in uh, uh, Northern Kentucky, Cincinnati International Airport, and which is a big DHL hub. Uh, so it's great. It's a great business, but I, I love being an entrepreneur. <laughs> um, it's like yeah. business and aviation are probably my two biggest passions and writing too. Like I still, I still, like to, I still like to write too. I, yeah, I write. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm glad you brought that up because I couldn't find my copy. I somehow from the last time you and I spoke till today, I've lost it. So I'm glad you brought it up. Yep. This was the book that got, that got that, uh, my uh, producer said, hey, you got to check out this book. And that's how I found out about you. And it's available on Amazon. And uh, it's called Mastering Fear, A Navy SEAL's Guide. 
And one of the things that I really enjoyed about this book is that it starts off very organically with uh, your best friend who's afraid to swim. Yeah. And you realize that, you know, that we all have some kind of weird fear, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, maybe it's a, maybe it's getting in the water, maybe it's uh, high places, whatever. And, and that kind of started this mastering fear uh, book. And I just thought it was, I mean, I, I just love the book. I thought it was great. And, you know, what I enjoyed about it, not only was it organic about this thing, this experience with your friend, but you talk about, you know, uh, the, the class between you and your dad and, and, um, and, and all that other stuff. So there was so much that was relatable about it, even though it's written by a, a former Navy SEAL. I think that 90% of it, certainly 80% of it is day to day life stuff that anybody can relate to. And maybe 10 to 20% of it, you bring in some of your Navy SEAL stuff because there is you know, there is that point where um, you, uh, you and uh, and some of the other guys are uh, about to have a, um, a, you know, some kind of contact with uh, the bad guys, so to speak. And, yeah. and uh, you know, uh, so you talk about that, but that's the only thing I remember from the book. Everything else was, you know, leaving home, starting your business, going through your divorce, um, and you also talk about flying in there as well. So a lot of it was relatable to, you know, everybody. Yeah. I, I thought it was a great book. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm excited to, to have you on here and talk about it. So let's do this since um, it starts with you and, um, uh, you know, your buddy uh, in the swim class. Talk about that. And then let's talk about you leaving home uh, at the age of 16. Sure. So, yeah, I met Kamal uh, when I moved. I left Nevada um, where I started a business and moved the company to Puerto Rico and, and New York. So we have a, a core office in Puerto Rico for, for the tax laws down there. They have really favorable tax laws. Um, and I got to know Kamal, who's also an author, very successful guy, runs, you know, the partner in AngelList, which his brother Naval started. Um, Kamal runs a small uh, technology focused venture capital fund is a best-selling author and, and him and I just kind of hit it off and what people don't realize about Kamal too is he's actually an army veteran he, he looks like an Indian guru with these <laughs> long you know white hair and um, handsome looks and and no one would guess that he was an army uh, infantry guy for a couple years um, so he's also a, a veteran which we we kind of shared that that bond of, of service but we got to know each other and became um, really good friends after a mutual friend introduced us and over the years I slowly he confided in me that he had not learned to swim and he had this terrible fear of water and and that was limiting you know you go to uh, you know he gets invited to to go to a resort in Bali and talk, give a roundtable talk with these entrepreneurs and and he's like afraid to jump in the pool or go swimming in the ocean. I mean, that, it's just a super limiting um, thing. And, and it was, you know, it was something he dealt with most of his life as a, as a guy in his uh, early 40s. So, and he asked me, hey, what a, can you recommend a swim school and this and that? And I was like, you know, I, I know you've been to a few in the past, but let's, let me try and teach you. And he's, and he, I think like a lot of people would expect. Kamal thought, oh my God, this is my worst nightmare. This Navy SEAL is gonna like tie me up and throw me in the water in the deep end. And and I but I which wasn't the case, right? I, I fortunately had a, been through a, a lot of mental management training uh when when uh we were uh redoing our sniper program. We brought in a, you know some of the best coaching uh consultants in the world and um had a, a lot of like mental management and fear management uh, training. So I applied that, you know, long story short, over a week had Kamal, uh, when Monday he was afraid to even get climb in the pool from the ladder, he could do a cannonball and sink himself to the bottom of the pool on Friday um, and swim. Like he was, you know, not gonna break any swim records, but could swim and was could save his life if he fell off, off a boat. And to me, that was a, 
a success. And then on the subway back uh, from the pool to lunch, he said, you got to write a book about this. He, he's like, you have changed my life. Um, you, he call, he's like, you should call it killing fear. And he's like, no one's been able to do what you've been able to do for me. And you kind of like took me on these baby steps and build my confidence up. And, um, and, and that's where people failed in the past to teach him how to swim. They were, they were just throwing him right in the, in the pool and trying to teach him strokes when I knew, okay, I've got to address his fear of the water. I have to get him uh, comfortable. And so I, I applied a lot of techniques that um, they, they use for infants to teach how to swim right out of the womb. Um, so I had to like put his face in the water, out of the water, in the water, just do these drills a hundred times to get him like comfortable. Cause most people fear the water. They don't want to put the face in the water. Right. But if you're holding onto the side and you could, you know, do that a hundred times, like, okay, I got this. This is, I'm, I'm bored with this now. Let's move on. And so I kind of took him crawl, walk, run, as we call it in the military. And yeah, and taught him. And, and then what I realized and what he shared with me is like, look, I think a lot of people would be, would be open to you sharing your experience and, and fears because we all have fear. Um, and, and I think, again, a, a common um, belief of a guy that's been in the SEAL team is like, oh, they're fearless. And no, no, fear, fear is good. Fear keeps you alive. Um, but it can also be a limiting factor in your life. And so, um, you know, I wanted to share my own experiences uh, dealing with fear, like personal, real stories, but also my own experience working in this in training some of the best snipers in the world and, and how we teach them to deal with stress and fear um and and share that and, and get people to share their stories as well i feature a lot of different people in the book from a variety of careers from nasa astronaut scott kelly who was afraid he shared with me he was afraid that he wasn't good enough to be an astronaut when he applied to uh uh, my friend Betsy Morgan, who was the first kind of institutional CEO at Huffington Post, but she left a very promising career at CBS um, to go run the Huffington Post. And Les Moonves, who people know um, from CBS, uh, right. ran, ran it for years and years, and you know, unfortunately, was was uh, um, booted recently for that, uh, rightfully so, uh, it appears for for the sexual harassment stuff, but, but right. left, I remember he was a very powerful media executive as a, as the um, CEO of CBS told Betsy, Hey, you're, you're insane. Like who the hell is going to read the news on the internet? That's what he told her. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, she was scared, you know, she was scared to make that career move. Um, but anyway, I, you know, the book, um, mastering fear, um, you know, it's probably one of my best pieces of work because it, it it really, I think, it has helped a lot of people. Um, I use it when I was a parent, you know, the, some of the same techniques I talk about in the book uh, as a parent and now raising, seeing my kids get into their early teens and, and really fearless. My daughter at her eighth grade end of year, um, I don't know what they call it, but they do this big you know, assembly and the parents and kids put on a bunch of shows and she emceed the whole thing by herself, wrote a speech. And I was, wow. like, I was like, as an eighth grader, I would be terrified to, to even get up in the class and say a few words. And I was like, man, she, she, you are fearless, Olivia. And she's like, yeah, but you know, you, you know, you taught me how to fly a plane upside down. Um, this is nothing. And I was like, okay, I'm, I got a good <laughs> as a parent for that one. Um, but it's been cool to see, to apply it as a parent and coach to my own kids and see them just do like more, you know, the best thing you can hope for as a parent is to kind of pass on that experience and have your kids do more than you did at their age. And, and, and I'm seeing that now, like, it, you know, both my son and daughter are on the speech and debate team at school and, um, you know, getting up and making arguments in front of you know, room full of people and, and judges. It's pretty cool to watch. Yeah, that's very cool. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's so funny because just recently, one of my daughters 
lost her phone and uh, she, uh, like a lot of people, she has her wallet slash phone, right? So her ID, her money, her credit cards, all those things are gone. Yeah. And luckily it was found by an honest person who uh, uh, said, hey, uh, I found this phone and and uh, I said, well, great. You know, you need to call that guy. First of all, thank him very much and let him know that, you know, you know, find out what we need to do to, to get that to get your phone back. And she looks at me and, and my daughter is uh, 17 and she looks at me and goes, Dad, I'm not going to call a stranger. <laughs> <laughs> and, and me being the the uh, what do you call it? The uh, great teacher that I am. I was first of all, I was I just I, it didn't compute. So I said, OK, uh, you can just go stand in that corner till you're ready to go talk to him. I just didn't know what. <laughs> well, you know, you're, you're afraid, you know, because. There's so many people that now don't talk to, you know, they'll text, but they're not going to talk. Yeah. And uh, and so uh, it is, you know, it is uh, good to be able to uh, have your kids overcome their fear. And, and granted, I didn't do it the best way, but it was like one of those things where it was, I don't know, I, I was just uh, not maybe the most uh, coaching attitude. So I just, you know, just get in that corner. So you're ready to talk to him uh, and she goes okay I'll, I'll just go talk to him thank you and yeah. you know and she did and it wasn't an awful experience and and, and life is good but uh it, you know back to what you're talking about yeah getting your kids to overcome their fear getting them to do things um better faster sooner than you did is i think uh it is a great uh what's the word milestone for any parent i think it's always kind of cool to be able to do that. Uh, all right. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about you leaving um, home at the age of 16. And so so kind of give us a little talk about that. Sure. So, you know, I, as I talked about earlier in the show, um, you know, I had this experience as a, you know, I think I was 12 turning 13. The, the, the summer I got my first real, what I consider my real job on a, a sport scuba diving boat out of Ventura Harbor uh, called the Dive Boat Peace. Uh, it was about 70 foot, had a hot tub on the boat, and we would take sport divers out to the Channel Islands um, and dive all these incredible dive spots and have fun. You know, it was a fun boat and fun place to work on. We had a private chef. Um, and I started working on that boat as a young kid. The captain taught me how to scuba dive um, and certified me at 13 um, and you know, I worked my way up as a fully paid deckhand by the time I was 15 uh, and had an incredible experience, you know, being able to drive and navigate the boat, to cook, to, you know, take, take the trash out. To, and then the diving experience was incredible. And I probably have, you know, a couple thousand dives logged from working on that boat. Um, from you know my own my own sport diving, uh, which you know usually we we would trade off the guys that worked the boat. One guy could jump in each spot, and we would trade. Um, but the point is, I had all this boating experience, and and also grew, grew up pretty fast because I had you know, a story I shared in the book. Mastering fear was you know the first time I was really scared and had to confront my own issues. Um, was I was afraid of sharks and and dark water and the captain woke me up um, uh, two in the morning. Uh, we're at San Miguel Island, which is uh, sea lion and seal habitat on the backside of the island. And we were we were there in the daytime, uh, did a couple dives, anchored for the night, but the weather started to get rough. And he woke me up uh, two in the morning and said, hey, you gotta get your suit on and dive down and get the anchor unstuck. And, and I had done that before in the daylight um, but not in shark infested water <laughs> and not at two in the morning and it's dark and it's the weather. It's just, you know, nasty wind and waves. And I was like, oh man, this is my worst nightmare. Yeah. And so I had to, you know, I dealt with it and, and got the anchor unstuck and realized it wasn't as bad as I, I had thought and made up in my head. Um, and then fast forward, my dad, 
you know, when I was uh, 15, about to turn 16, he announced to the family, look, we've been talking about taking this big sailing trip. Um, and we had done a, some smaller trips locally into Mexico on, on, on the family sailboat, which we were living on for five years. And, and uh, we had a 47 foot catch. And he said, we're gonna do it. We're gonna sail to um, Australia and, and just kind of see what, see what happens. You know, my dad, so my dad um, left his job at the time. He, was, he had a comp construction company um, and then went to work in the construction industry as a superintendent uh, in California. And he, so, he, you know, we had saved up some money and he's like, I don't want to talk about this dream your mom and I have of sailing the world because, you know, you're, in the, you're living in the harbor and people, you know, they're like, they buy a boat, sometimes they live on it and there's this dream of sailing around the world, but they, they talk about it and they never execute. And, and that was an important lesson I learned from my dad, you know, thinking back now, um, it takes a lot of guts to to kind of do something like that and make the commitment to take your whole family. This is a time we didn't have GPS. You're going to take your family sailing halfway around the world. No GPS. You had to do it the old fashioned way with a, a sextant. Right. You know, sun and star um, navigate by the stars. Essentially, we did have a sat nav, which we would get if we're lucky one fix every 12 hours as a satellite went around. Um, but you know, I'm a hormonal 15 year old kid. Last thing I want to do is get on the, be crammed into close quarters of my family and go on this crazy sailing trip when I have this amazing job and earning real money as a 15 year old. Um, yeah, I wanted to chase girls and get my driver's license and do the things that teenage boys do. Um, but I went and I made it, we went, had an amazing trip through Mexico, then from Acapulco, I turned 16 in, in Acapulco. We went to uh, the South Pacific uh, via the Marquesas Islands, which is the first, when you sail uh, west to the South Pacific, it's the first island chain. Then you get to the French Tuamotos um, and the French Polynesia, which is Tahiti, Borbora, Morea. Um, things heated up in the South Pacific. My dad and I started arguing over seamanship and we had a big blow up in Tahiti. And he says, I think it's time for you to leave. <laughs> I was like, you're right, you're damn right, I'm, I'm out of here. So, and then cried myself to sleep the first three nights, uh, scared, scared out of my mind. Um, but, you know, it was a decision we kind of made as a family and I crewed on a, I found a catamaran that was looking for crew to sail to Hawaii. And, and so my plan was I'd finish my junior year early. I had, you know, phoned home. I had to go ashore and call my old boss, uh, Bill, who owned the boat and said, Hey, Bill, can I kind of get my job back? And he's like, yeah, no problem. You can even live on the boat if you want. So um, I did that. I, I left home and finished high school on my own. Uh, and, you know, a lot of it I talk about my first book, The Red Circle, um, for for my reasons, um, I found the Navy SEAL program. I'd always want to be a fighter pilot, but I, I had such a weird academic record. Um, and to be honest, I was bounced around schools and home study, and I didn't have a strong math background as I should. And, and I like no academy would accept me. So I wanted to join the Naval Academy and, um, you know, be a, be a pilot in the Navy. But I, I ended up finding this Navy SEALs and found out that the GI Bill was available. I could, I could get my college paid for uh, that way. And, and so I ended up joining the Navy uh, right out of high school. Uh, and yeah, I had a, you know, I had a great, a great career. And, you know, I think a lot of the lessons I've learned uh, in the military, especially around leadership, good and bad, I, I had plenty of terrible bosses and that's part of life. I remember going to my uh, my son Hunter's uh, parent-teacher conference this year and he's a he is a straight-A kid, 1400 SAT, smart kid, but he's like, Dad, I, I've got a problem. This English teacher is the hardest teacher I've ever had and he's, I can't get above an A and I was like, well, what's the problem? And so we went, we went to this, to meet with this teacher and he was a hard case right even to me he's like no smile 
no shaking hands. It's like, hey, have a seat. All right, honey. and he tells my son, he's like, what do you got? And I was like, oh man, this guy, this guy's not messing around. But I, I told Hunter, I was like, look, you're gonna have people like this in your life, and it's unavoidable. Like it's, right. and it's not that this guy's a bad guy. Is his style? Like you aren't able to put on the charm and just skate through this class on your good looks and charm and smarts. Like you gotta, you gotta like, con, you got. He is your customer in this case, right? I think a lot of employees get this mixed up. Um, they think their customer is the customer of the company when they realize, look, if your boss is an asshole, um, it doesn't matter. Like he's your boss, he's your customer. You have to make him happy until you can change and get out of that environment. And that's yeah. what I, that's what I told Hunter. I was like, you, you're stuck, and you need. This is a life lesson right here. We're gonna learn and talk about this, and you need. What he's saying you need to do, you gotta do, even though if you don't wanna do it. Um, if, it if you think it's stupid or doesn't make sense, it doesn't matter, because that's, he's the teacher, he's the boss, he's your customer. Right. And so I had this conversation with him, and I was like, this is not gonna be the first time you're gonna be in an environment where you think you're smarter than the other person, and you think things could be done better or taught better. Um, gotta suck it up. And so he's sucking it up now. <laughs> <laughs> and he's getting a B to an A. Um, so but you know what? And I think that is a great. Uh, that's a great life lesson. It's a great teaching moment. There are so many people of our generation. I'm probably a little bit older than you are, but you know, there, there are a lot of parents out there who try to make things easier for their kids, and they rob their child of yeah. developing that thickness, that hardness, that self-belief that they can do hard things because, you know, not everything is a participation trophy. Yeah. And, and so I've had the same thing uh, with my daughters and, and uh, you know, they have a teacher that they clash with and yeah, say, I, I gave them the same advice. There's just not yeah. a whole lot you can do. Yeah. Um, you just got to kind of suck it up. I want to talk about this real quick and, you um, in the book, you talk about uh, connecting with the New York chapter of the YPO um, and how that helped you out a lot. And, and so I want to talk about that because I'm a big believer in masterminds. I'm a big believer in getting around people who are smarter, better, faster than you and, and, and how this is able to uh, help you to grow your business quicker and faster. So talk about those guys for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's been scientifically proven, right? And, and in many ways that your environment directly impacts, um, even from a single cellular level, your environment impacts many things. Uh, and so applying that to business, if you're hanging around people that are, majority of them have small businesses and they don't operate large businesses, you're going to be kind of stuck in that mindset. And there's nothing wrong with running a small business if it's a choice, right? But for me, I wanted to scale my company. And I had joined an organization called the Entrepreneurs Organization, which was an incredible resource for me. Um, but I was, but the majority of the businesses in that community were in the US, especially was 2 million or less in revenue. And I was starting to scale and finding out, wow, I don't have, I can't go to my same network a year ago and ask for help or advice because they don't, I'm having problems that no one has had before at this level. So I needed to level up. And so I started looking, you know, for ways to do that. And I've always kind of in business, you know, had, had good uh, mentors, which I sought out and, you know, I think a lot of people make a mistake when they're when they're looking for a mentor, and and oftentimes, you know, this it turns into friendship, right? And right. but they the initial and I get approached all the time now on, on Instagram. They oh, will you mentor me with this? And it's like, look, you've got to have something to offer in return. Um, and sometimes it's it's just paying somebody to to get on the phone, or you know, it's it's it could be as simple as you know paying for lunch. But I think most people just they oh, I need a mentor and I'm going to, you know, just get somebody, somebody's time. And, and in most cases, those, those people realize how valuable time is. 
um, and they just don't want to waste it on somebody that doesn't appreciate it or isn't reciprocating. So, um, yeah, you know, in, in part of that, I want to just add this is that what you're talking about is that, yeah, there's got to be some kind of value for you or there's got to be some kind of skin in the game, something because uh, you're right. I get asked this all the time. Well, you mentor me. Why? Why me? You know, I mean, and that's why joining a group is sometimes a, a quick, fast way to get mentoring. Yeah. But uh, yeah, if you're a person out there looking for a free mentor, good luck. A, a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, because unless you have something extremely valuable to offer in return, and, and and a lot of like, I think if you're if there's millennial viewers out there, look, you've got plenty to offer. I mean, just the millennial experience with social media, you could really say, okay, how can I help this person understand the changing landscape of social media and, and stuff like that. So there's plenty of, like people just need to put some thought into it and, and what they can offer another person in return. And my friend James Altucher is the best at that. Like he is an extremely accomplished guy, but when he was building his first business, he, he would reach out to Warren Buffett, but he had a list like, hey Warren, I've studied, this is what you're doing, and I think these 10 ideas you can apply directly to your business that I came up with and he got Warren Buffett on the phone, like that's, you know, and, but he put some thought into it. But the, the back to your core question about YPO, I found YPO as a threshold, you know, you have to be doing, I think the minimum is 10 million in revenue. Like you have to run a, a mid-sized business or larger to, to get accepted into the organization. And, and you know, I, at the time I applied, I, I just snuck in the door um, and, you know, my, the chapter I belong to has hundreds of billions in revenue, like responsibility, and there's 70 people in the chapter. So there's some, I mean, in my, you, you have a chapter and then you break into a forum that you meet with monthly and you kind of pick your forum, like they pick you, you pick them. And usually it's about seven, eight, seven, eight people, mix of men and women. And in my forum, I have, I think three, three guys that run a billion dollar p l businesses and so um you know i'm around this and i'm able to to kind of grow and network and see the problems that i'm having how they can be solved because these guys have been there right they've scaled up and run large organizations and you know the problems at scale are much different than than running a small business and you have to surround yourself with with that kind of people and now you know ypo we bring in the world's best like the best ai um professor at at stanford or singularity university um you know we're just able to kind of bring in experts i had dinner with uh, giuliani a couple weeks ago uh, very private setting able to ask him questions about hey, how do you how was it running New York City after 9-11? And what were your problems? How do you deal with this? Um, how did you lower crime? Um, that kind of thing. It just you get access to this incredible um, Group of people and to your point like whatever it is whether it's a mastermind group There are a lot of really good ones out there um, But you have to if, it doesn't matter what you do career-wise if you want to be the best in your career field, whether you're an artist, a movie maker, um, a business owner, you have to find these organizations and and push yourself. Because I, you know, I think I don't know if you can relate to this. You know, I as I had success in my second company, and you kind of people don't like change, and it's a constant challenge for me to remind myself I don't know it all. And I'm not as smart as I think I am sometimes. And I have to get out and force myself to, to get different perspectives. And, I, and a real world example of that is last year, we had a mini Harvard University where we brought in the best professors from, three of the top professors from uh, Harvard Business School. And they ran this mini university. And I almost didn't sign up because I'm like, what the hell are these Harvard folks going to show me about business. They're professors, you know, um, what the hell do they know? And, and, but I signed up and I went and I was blown away, like how smart and how much like these, not only did they teach, they were 
you know, actively involved in boards of major companies from Ikea um, on. And I was like, whoa, like, boy, did I get this wrong. And it just was a reminder, you know, that I, I have, that you're never done learning and to always be open to change and, and new things because, you know, just look at two industries in the last 10 years that have been radically disrupted and that's traditional cable media, terrestrial radio included in that mix because um, it's all digital. And if, right. you're, if you're a media company relying on advertising sales, you're dead. That's why like CBS, that model is dead. It's working now until the older demographic dies off. Um, so you've got media, uh, the trans transition from cable to digital, and then you have traditional bricks and mortar retail getting massively disrupted by e-commerce. And if you don't have an experienced based retail company where I would say Bass Pro would be a good example on the, on the men's demographic, uh, where you walk into Bass Pro, you can, you can fly fish in the bass tank. You can right. shoot bow and arrow inside. Like it's just crazy stuff, but it's a fun place to go visit and spend money. Um, compare that on the woman's side, Saks Fifth Avenue. Like that's an experience. Shopping at Saks is a is an experience in itself, as opposed to just going online. But you know that the companies that didn't get with it are out of business. Borders, Barnes and Noble will be right behind them. And I hate to say that because I'm an author, but if they don't change, like it sucks. Like it's not a good experience to shop at BNN. I would just rather buy the book on Amazon. Right. Well, and, and, and you know, one of the, one of the lessons from what you're talking about, uh, Blockbuster, uh, I, I had the opportunity to interview the uh, CEO of Blockbuster when it was going through all those changes. And he said that the thing that, that killed Blockbuster was their ego. Yeah. that uh, they had a chance to do business with Netflix uh, two or three different times. But they had this collective, it wasn't, there wasn't one person who was saying, let's do Netflix. Nobody thought Netflix was going to harm their business because they were so big. I mean, they had like 4,000 plus stores. There is this, they're the mega giant. Oh yeah. And uh, the, even though, the, even their research said, hey, Netflix is going after this this different crowd. They're not going to affect us. Uh, and, and they just they, the, they hung on to that. And he said it, it was their, their ego, their willingness not to, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, really look at it from, uh, you know, get maybe get some outside consultants because, uh, and so it was ego and then there was fear. And so one of their fears was, well, if we start doing the Netflix model, we're going to, uh, start, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, when you start eating up your own customers, right? You're competing against yourself and you start eroding your customer base uh, um, is kind of what the, the thought. But bottom line is ego and fear. That's why Blockbuster disappeared. And so they tried to compete with uh, uh, Redbox. They came out with Blue Box. They tried to... Uh, they started uh, it was a disaster. It was a disaster. They started trying to compete with uh, Netflix. They did the, the home version, uh, call it uh, Blockbuster Home. And one of the things that I thought might save them was the fact that you could get your DVD via the mail. And if you wanted to, you could drop it off at the store. And I thought, well, that's nice leg up, right? A little advantage there. Uh, but then um, Carl Icahn, who uh, owned at that time a majority stake of the company, he, he he basically got that CEO booted out um, and he rallied the troops saying, hey, you know, we're too big. We're too strong. We're never going to we're never going to disappear. Bottom line is five years after they got rid of that CEO, the company was gone. They filed bankruptcy. So, you know, that's what ego and fear does to you. Boys are us the same way. And, and I anyway. and it's to me, it's it's a cultural issue, right? It's the it's the it role, the company. The corporate culture is that's a key sign that the culture is is not one of innovation um, and look at you know compare it to a company like nike that's been able to just survive and adapt and thrive um and because that there's a culture of excellence at nike and so you know that's it's it's so important to pay attention to that because it look you know barnes and noble 
if I was a CEO of Barnes and Noble tomorrow, I would shut down every uh, Barnes and Noble store except maybe a few flagships, and I would make them an incredible experience to shop there, with you know four or five authors a day coming in, yeah. and make it about the book experience. In the same way, I, some of my favorite book shops in the country are these small indie shops because they curate these amazing sections and and um, it's just a great experience. But if and in Barnes and Noble has another opportunity, I would go, I would go all in on the book online book shopping experience the way Amazon used to be, right? Like Amazon is an amazing place to go explore and, and these books because they started with books and then they just right. grew and now it's super easy to buy books on Amazon but it's not a great experience right and so you know Barnes and Noble has an opportunity right now to be the best e-commerce book buying experience out there because Amazon doesn't want that they're into everything you know, everything yeah. and so it to me I see an opportunity but but you have this culture at Barnes and Noble where it's it's the same as Blockbuster, most likely, the same as a lot of these media companies I've met with who the, some of the top level people bring us in, hey, help, help us manage our digital archives, you guys are a digital network, and I see these the arrogance and the ego on these executives that are like, who the hell are these guys, and how are they gonna show me? Or they just don't care, like that's another problem. Um, a lot of these executives are like it's not my problem i'm going to be retired and long gone i don't give a shit about that right. i'm gonna I'm, I'm i'm jumping this ship with a golden parachute either way and that's a problem that's a that's an organizational issue that should be fixed at the top level um if you have that environment and i've seen i see it a lot and, and look we're you know we're probably 24 months from a recession and you see who's going to and look, a lot of opportunities in recessions, but you're going to see these big companies go down hard um, in this next recession because they're not going to have, you know, to be dipping into the, you know, the the public's pockets if they're a publicly traded company. The, the money won't be there, um, and they won't have this kind of bullish market behind them um, to keep going. They're going to have to face the music, and and I think I give Barnes and Noble two years tops, like they're gonna go down in the next recession, I would bet, you know, I would bet a lot of money on it. And it's, you know, it's it's sad because it's they have an opportunity to kind of really um, do something special and they're the last big kind of bookseller. Right, well, and, and I like what you said there, uh, they are so focused on uh, maybe the wrong things that they're, they're, they're missing the opportunity to be this flagship book experience. Uh, yeah, and then they're trying Apple. to sell you. You walk into Barnes and Noble and they're trying to sell you. Starbucks. And all sorts of crap. Like, look, it's like a CVS almost. It's like, I could go to CVS for the same experience. Um, I'm not here to buy, you know, house cleaner. I want to buy books. And, and so that's the, you know, that's where they're missing the boat. And yeah, I agree. There's. There's a lot there that can be done, and uh, we're, we're short on time. So I want to I I want to uh, focus back on uh, on uh, on your book, uh, Mastering Fear: A Navy SEAL's Guide. And I want to wrap it up with this. Uh, there I'll it is. It. There it is. So uh, in the book, it, it's if I'm not mistaken, it's five basic strategies or tips to mastering your own fear. So let's talk about that. Or why don't you walk us through uh, those steps on mastering our fears? Yeah, so I mean, it, I know we're short on time. So it, it's really like, first is the aware, self-awareness and, and decision, right? Like, hey, I have this issue that's holding me back, whether it's uh, anchored in relationships, career, in Kamal's case, this fear of the water. So really like, the decision point is key. Like I, I'm making a conscious decision to kind of let this go. And then I talk about the second step was rehearsal process. Depend and it really is fear dependent, right? Like if you have a fear of public speaking, um, there's a lot of stuff you can do on the mental rehearsal side to, to kind of prepare yourself and visualize. I talk big about visualization because it's so powerful and, and it, it comes from the, 
you know, the top performers in the world use visualization techniques. So the rehearsal part is kind of, um, look, you can do stuff to prepare yourself uh, before you're gonna jump out of a plane or in, into that public speaking arena. Um, and then in three, I touch on the letting go part because a lot of, um, a lot of uh, people, I feel they're, they, they kind of get, they hold on to things, right? And I talk about a good example uh, in the book I use is, is letting go of the coconut. They, how they, jungle warfare, survivalists teach people to capture monkeys. They dig a hole in the jungle, they put a coconut in the hole and they put sticks so the monkey reaches in with both hands and he can't pull the coconut out because the sticks are blocking him. All you have to do is let the coconut go and he can run free, but the monkey just holds onto the coconut and yeah. then, you know, the Filipino jungle warfare instructor comes along and just bonks him in the head with a stick and now the monkey's dinner. And that's what people do. They don't let go of their, their issues that hold them back. And, and I see it a lot in relationships. Somebody goes through a bad relationship and they think all, they project their fears and insecurities outwardly. And anybody that sees that runs away, like on the positive side. I, I mean, I, I was single for a few years and, and I would deal with that all the time. Like these uh, women and men, men have it as well, but they hold on. They think everybody's a cheater. Everyone's out to get them. And nobody wants to start a relationship with somebody that, that, that has that out, outward uh, issue. And so you got to let go, right? That's the third thing I talk about. You got to let that stuff go and move on. Um, and then four is kind of the execution part. Uh, of the fear like okay actually you've decided you've rehearsed you've let go of all your past bs and now you're ready to execute and kind of jump off um and then i i wrap it up with the fifth thing is just really knowing what matters and i i was like how do i put that in the front of the book or the back but uh, we decided to put it john and i who, who i wrote the book with decided to, to kind of finish up with knowing what matters because look if you if you want like I think, you know, in many cultures it's called different things, right? But it's that life pur purpose. And when you look at the people that live the longest and they call them the blue zones, right? Across, the core characteristic of those people in the blue zones from uh, Japan, Okinawa and Japan to Greece, they all have purpose. They all have a sense of purpose and to get up every morning and live past a hundred. and I think too many people don't spend enough time really thinking about what matters in their life. And that's why these, I have a, a friend whose husband was a doctor and he, he was a doctor because his parents told him to be a doctor and he hated medicine. Now imagine spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, wasting all that time going to med school, which is a huge undertaking. Um, and then, practicing medicine and go, oh, this sucks. I never wanted to do this in the first place. I'm like, you know, all the time and money and energy and resources wasted when if you just had to spend, you know, a couple of days by yourself with no distractions thinking about what you want and what really matters to you and what you're passionate about, you know, you can avoid a lot of things like that. That's, that's an extreme example, but that's why I think it's so important for people to, to realize what matters and, and really, when you, I, I did this exercise once where I forget what made me do it, but you could print out, you can assume that you live to 85, 90 years old and take your current age and then basically print out a calendar and you realize it will fit on the back of one door. And when you see your life on the back of a door and realize there's room, you know, plenty of room, you realize that you don't have, that time is finite. It really shows you how little time we have on this planet and that it's, you better start getting living or, or not. <laughs> All right. uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Shawshank, get busy living or get busy dying. Yeah. What I have discovered that sometimes kind of back to what you're talking about, letting go of the coconut, uh, we hold on to so many coconuts. Uh, that 95% of the stuff we could completely let go of and we would we would just probably feel a relief. It's not going to affect us at all. 95% of the stuff really doesn't matter. 
you know, back to what you're saying, uh, know what's important. Uh, so many people get hung up on stuff that simply doesn't get matter. Uh, yeah. You know, and it, it's, you know, I'll use Donald Trump right now. There's so many people that you mentioned Donald Trump and then you have some people who really like him and there's some people who really hate him. The reality is for most people, that doesn't matter. Uh, you know, that is not as important as, you know, making sure that your kids are, are well uh, developed, uh, making sure that they, that your, you know, that your family is, um, you know, feels the love and that you're building that legacy. Uh, you know, knowing that your employees are well taken care of. And, and as you mentioned, that they, they're, they're flexible and they can, they're free to take to be with their family. You know, there's so many things that as humans, we get hung up on that doesn't matter. Uh, it, it's amazing to me. Uh, listen, we're out of time. I want to say thank you so much for, for stopping by and sharing. I want to go over this real quick. Uh, number one is awareness. Uh, two, rehearsal. I love that. Rehearse, visualize. Uh, letting go of our baggage, our coconuts, if you will. And then ultimately you got to pull the trigger. You got to execute. And then last but not least, know what matters. Um, you know, Brandon, it's been a pleasure getting to know you and I look forward to, uh, uh, to having you back again. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Good All time. right.